The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. So, good morning, everyone. So I, I think you all know that this presidential election season has been particularly stressful and anxiety producing for many people. The degree of anger and hostility and fear that uh, seems to be in the wider society or within families and is um, pretty high for many people. I saw some article this weekend in some magazine, I don't know what it was, magazine, but it seemed like it was like a business weekly magazine or something that uh, about uh, how to cope with this, the stress of the election. So I thought, that's curious. So I looked and the first thing it said was to meditate. <laughs> and then uh, it talked, you should name the emotion you have. And, you know, all these things that, you know, we do in mindfulness practice was listed. Um, And I think some of the anxiety and stress is fueled by the dramatic visions uh, we have of what will happen to this country and perhaps the world, depending on what the outcome is of the election. And I think some people find it addictive or compulsive to keep checking the news. And, um, and uh, the frequent uh, the ability to check news with the internet, check it regularly, and check hope for some new news, good news, or something, and read whatever, um, I think fuels the anxiety. So sometimes we're anxious, the very behavior that anxiety stimulates in us produces more anxiety. And so it gets stronger and stronger. One of the great practices I learned when I lived in Buddhist monasteries was uh, to read um, old newspapers. And the monasteries, the newspapers would come usually sometimes days late. And um, so I would still read the news. It wasn't so new anymore, but it was new for me. And, uh, and uh, so I could stay up well enough with what's going on in popular culture in the world. But uh, it lost its sting. There's something about getting news when it's new that has certain kind of authority or power or hook to us where it kind of grabs us in a way. And to read the newspaper, or we get, you know, it's a little harder now if people don't get the physical newspaper, but to read the news a day late um, kind of creates more space and calm and, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have the same pressure on it. Um, but uh, So I'd like to propose today that the core reason that people have anxiety both in this election cycle, but also often anxiety in their life, is from, from a lack of confidence. A lack of confidence. Um, <clears throat> I think that probably the lack of confidence is the leading causes of anxiety. And this is an unusual claim because often it's things that make us anxious. Things in the world, things in our health, things you know, there's these things we're concerned about that we say causing me to be anxious. But it's not really the things in the world that cause anxiety, but our relationship to them, how we're relating to it, how we're thinking about it, how we're imagining the, the, uh, them all. Um, and Buddhism puts a lot of emphasis that we have no guaranteed control over our life that we can't kind of get everything, everything lined up just perfectly and keep everything coasting along, just this is how it's going to be safe and sound and secure. And uh, we're going to have c control over that. Buddhism actually says the opposite, that uh, there's a lack of guarantee uh, and that things can change in a moment for us. Uh, there can be an accident, a natural disaster, there can be a health ch shift, a change within us very quickly that can make a dramatic change in our whole life as we live it. And uh, we do what we can to m mitigate or try to avoid having some of the big problems in life. But there's only so much we can do. 
And sometimes people live in the illusion that they have everything under control. Everything's st- safe and sound and stable. And then overnight, or even faster, uh, something changes dramatically and your life is never the same. Um, and sometimes this, whatever stability we have in our life, security, is st- often taken for granted so that we're surprised when we lose it. And, we th- and so we think, oh, you know, this isn't how it's supposed to be. It should be, it's supposed to be, it has to be. It was meant to be a different way. Um, <clears throat> so Buddhism emphasizes the nature of the world is instability. And that the cause of anxiety is our relationship to this instability. So what what is our role? What do we contribute to it? What happens to us? That's kind of where the sense of gravity of the investigation is for Buddhist practice. Um, And it's possible to have confidence as a healthy alternative to being anxious. And the confidence is an alternative that lives in us. So what is it in us that we can have confidence in? What is the source of unwavering confidence in the face of great challenges, in the face of instability in our world as we know it? <clears throat> There's an English uh, Buddhist teacher named Sangha Rakshita, started a whole a large movement of Buddhist movement in England and around the world. And he was studying Buddhism in northern India in the 50, 1950s mostly, early 60s. And, um, and he writes this about meeting a woman in the 1950s, a young woman and a French woman. And he doesn't, he doesn't say this, but I imagine that uh, this is a woman back who probably grew up uh, during World War II in, in, uh, in France and whatever that meant for her. I am reminded of a French Buddhist nun whom I knew in Kalimpong in the 1950s. She told me that in her student days in Paris, she used to like to visit museums and art galleries, which is how she found herself eventually at the Guimet Museum of Oriental Art. She was a rather militant, aggressive woman She told me she used to go around with a pair of ice skates with which to defend herself if she was attacked. Well, she said, I thought if I carried these skates with me, if anyone tried to attack me, I'd slash the blades across his face. But as she strode along the galleries of the Guimet, having left the skates in the cloakroom, looking to left and right rather fiercely as as, as she usually did, Suddenly, she encountered the image of a Buddha. From her description, I gather it was an image of, from ancient Cambodia. She just turned a corner, and there was a celebrated smile, faint and delicate and rather withdrawn, so characteristic of this Khmer style of sculpture. The whole expression of the face is intensely peaceful. This image, The face of this image just stopped her in her tracks. She told me that she stood looking at it without moving, almost without blinking, for 45 minutes. She couldn't take her eyes off it. The impression of peace, tranquility, and wisdom that emanated, that streamed, as it were, from those features were so strong that she couldn't pull herself away. She hadn't yet studied anything about Buddhism, but as soon as she saw this image, she felt compelled to ask herself, what is it that gives this expression to this image? What is it trying to tell me? What depths of experience does it come from? What could the sculpture have experienced to be able to express something like this? Confronted by this embodiment of awakening, she could not move away unchanged 
In fact, they determine the whole subsequent course of our life. So what did she see? I believe that she observed uh, that what she saw in this statue was something she knew inside of herself, something that she knew that was available to herself. She saw the possibility of peace, tranquility, and wisdom. But isn't it unreasonable, a fantasy, a romanticism, a denial, to stay peaceful, tranquil, and wise when potential danger is so great? When we can imagine terrible things coming? Some of the most inspiring meetings that I've had have been with people who are dying with peace. I think the happiest conversation, I believe that the happiest conversation I ever had with someone was close to her death from uh, terminal brain cancer. She was such a happy person and it was contagious. I got so happy from it, quite something. And I met a man here uh, this week, this last week, who uh, had also a terminal diagno has a terminal diagnosis of six months to a year. And he said the first month or so it was kind of difficult for him, the news and what to do, we try to figure out, figure things out. And then he said, since that first month, he's had more joy in his life than he's ever had before. Quite remarkable. Um, So when are, we, when are we pulled into the world of stress, of anxiety, of hostility, of anger? And is it necessary in the face of, ch of challenges? If, we'd fall, if we get pulled into those worlds of anxiety and hostility and anger, more often than not, it's because we have a lot of confidence in the value of doing so. So we're putting our confidence there. But is that really where we want to put our confidence? So where do we want to have our confidence? Where do we, where do we want our hearts, the confidence in our hearts to reside and to live? Um, one American we know turned toward conflict, turned towards the hatred in our society, turns towards danger that can arise in this American society. And he said, with great confidence, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness in a, in a descending spiral of destruction. The chain reaction of evil, hate begets hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken or we shall be plunged into the darkness of annihilation. That was Martin Luther King. And he also wrote, I am convinced that love is the most durable power in the world. It is not an, it is not an expression of impractical idealism but of practical realism. Far from being the pious injunction in, of a utopian dreamer, love is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. To return hate for hate does nothing but intensify the existence of evil in the universe. Someone must have sense enough and religion enough to cut off the chain of hate and evil. And this can only be done through love. I believe firmly that love is a transforming power that can lift a whole community to new horizons of fair play, goodwill, and justice. So he, has, he had remarkable confidence in something. He had confidence in alternative to anxiety, certainly, alternative to hate and anger, 
And his alternative was love, was peace. So to have confidence in that, to have such strong confidence in that, that we're not kind of thrown off balance by what what happens to us in our lives, or what we read in the newspaper and what goes on. To feel that that is the place where it begins, our life begins, where our future begins, in ourselves, in how we come forth, how we meet this moment, how we meet this world, how we meet what comes along. Confidence that we can find our way with whatever happens. If someone is playing a a competitive game, but they're pretty poor at the game, they can still radiate confidence. Not the confidence that they're going to win the game, they might lose. But the confidence that their self-worth, their peace, their well-being is not dependent on winning or losing the game. And to have, to know for oneself in such a deep way that one has this, that kind of confidence that we carry with us, that's in our heart. So we're not kind of pulled into the worlds of ideas and concepts and fantasies and projections into the future, what should, what is going to happen, what might happen, and lose touch with an abiding sense of presence, that's goodness that's here. If one knows how to live happily in a small budget, then one can remain confident rather than anxious or whether or not one gets a raise. The monastic life that I spent, much of my youth, young age, young, young adulthood living, was, uh, gave me a lot of confidence that I can live with almost nothing. I was very happy at during t- the monastic life with hardly any possessions at all, living in small rooms, living sometimes without a room. And it gave me a confidence that I don't, my well-being and happiness is not dependent on having a home and a lot of things that I have. And I feel very grateful and empowered by that lesson. And I'm blessed to have a home now and have a certain number of possessions. My wife sometimes is concerned with all my possessions I have because I've, I have too many, I have a lot of books. Buddhist books. <laughs> <clears throat> all these books that I own that are all telling me, don't be attached. <laughs> so, someday I'll leave them behind. So I feel very grateful that monastic, my monastic life. Um, and it has, I feel, it's given me a sense of freedom and ease in having possessions and having a home and having what finances I have because my inner happiness and well-being is not dependent on those. I, I, I don't put my eggs in that basket. So it kind of gives a certain confidence. If one has a confidence that one will not succumb to fear, hatred, and anger, then one does not fear becoming afraid, hateful, or angry. If one knows there's nothing worth getting attached to, then one can have confidence in staying unattached. Unattached meaning not clinging or not tightening up or resisting. Or to have confidence is the ability to stay at ease, that this is worthwhile, this is valuable. Some people get confidence in staying at ease, staying tranquil, staying peaceful, because they have seen that if they aren't, that they make poor choices. They engage in the conversations and problem solving in the world in ways that just make things worse. So to have confidence in a heart that's not attached to anything, confidence in the hearts which have peace, at ease. We can have confidence that there is a core within us that has forces of goodness, of love, kindness, peace, generosity, and wisdom. 
And if we have confidence in that core, confidence in that's what's within us, then we're more li- less likely to succumb to the surface impulses of hostility and fear. And I think for me, it's a dramatic contrast. What's kind of rooted deep inside of us and what's more surface? And I kind of believe that our deep inside are tremendous forces of goodness that we all have. If we have confidence that it is with our goodness that we shape our world, then we will not try to shape the world with our animosity and anxiety and selfishness. What is the direction we want to take our world? What do we want to contribute to it? So uh, I wanted to read a very touching passage of, uh, kind of that uh, goes back to the Buddha, Buddha's teachings, um, where he describes living in a world of instability. The, this has been going on for a long time, that our world's an unstable place. So um, it's not like a new thing, like, you know, you know like people who've been, you know, studying wisdom traditions or Buddhism will kind of, you know, read the newspaper and say, oh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> here we go. This is, this is how it's always been in some way. So here the Buddha says, fear results from resorting to violence. Just look, just look at how people quarrel and fight. But let me tell you now of the kind of dismay and terror that I felt. It's very unusual to get the Buddha talking about his inner turmoil that he felt before he became enlightened. Let me tell, tell you now of the kind of dismay and terror that I felt. Seeing people struggling like fish, writhing in shallow water with enmity against one another, I became afraid. At one time, I had wanted to find some place where I could take shelter but I never saw any such place. There's nothing in this world that is solid at base and not a part, and not a part of it that is changeless. I've seen them all trapped in mutual conflict and that is why I felt so repelled. But then I noticed something buried deep in their hearts. It was, I could just make it out, a dart. It is a dart in the heart that makes its victims run all over the place. But once it has been pulled out, all that running is finished, and so is the exhaustion that comes with it. So in the world of fear and violence and conflict, there's a dart, and the dart that uh, usually that uh, the way it's explained in the Buddhist text, it's the dart of clinging, of grasping, holding tight. Sometimes it's the dart of selfishness, me, myself, and mine. But there's something in there. A dart is like a foreign object. And so this idea that this, you know, there's kind of an idea in Buddhism that, there, that this, the, the forces of suffering that exist within us are kind of like foreign objects in there. They're not inherent and if possible to recognize them and pull them out. And we pull out our attachments, pull out our clinging, pull out our fear, anxiety about the future, about things. When we can have confidence in our good heart, confidence in the power of love and compassion, peace and wisdom, and we know that it's here with us, in us, then we do not need to have the perfect job or the perfect living arrangement or the perfect partner or the perfect meditation or the perfect health to be at peace, (coughs) to be free. (coughs) All those conditions are unstable and shifting and changing, and if we're trying to have them all lined up to be perfect, 
then we're never going to find rest, never going to find, drop into the goodness that's here within us, the goodness which is portable, that we can carry with us everywhere we go, the goodness that no matter how terrible it gets around us, to have the confidence to keep coming from that, because that is where our home is, that is what is most valuable for us, that is where our well-being, our happiness resides. And that is where the best gifts that we can give the world reside as well. Because if we want to create peace and well-being in our world, it's hard to do that if we're angry, if we participate in the conflicts, if we don't stop and really listen and witness and see what's going on. There's a Zen teacher up in Portland, Portland named Hogan Bays. And uh, he wrote this. And this is, I think, a, a poem of great confidence. In this passing moment, karma ripens and all things come to be. I vow to choose what is. If there is a cost, I choose to pay. If there is a need, I choose to give. If there is pain, I choose to feel. If there is sorrow, I choose to grieve. When burning, I choose heat. When calm, I choose peace. When starving, I choose hunger. When happy, I choose joy. Whom I encounter, I choose to meet. What I shoulder, I choose to bear. When it is my death, I choose to die. Where this takes me, I choose to go. Being with what is, I respond to what is. So this confidence that uh, Hogan Bayes has is not a withdrawal from the world. It's not an indifference to the world. Rather, I hope it is the opposite. I hope that, uh, I believe that anxiety and fear and anger are more powerful forces of withdrawal, of separation, than the forces of love and kindness, compassion, generosity, goodness that we have. And I have put a, a lot of confidence that if we learn how to rest in our good hearts and not sacrifice it, not sacrifice our true peace and well-being, that then we can be forces of good in the world. And I hope, that, I think the world could use a lot of us to respond. And we don't know when we'll really be put to the test. And are we ready for that? If great conflict visits our society, are we ready to choose to step towards it in the way that Martin Luther King stepped towards it? Are we ready to step for forward and be a force of good and change for society? Or will we just wither away in our anger and our fear and anxiety and kind of give up? I think that if we can have confidence in our goodness and confidence in the possibility of deep abiding sense of well-being and peace that doesn't depend on things in the world, that's a gem. I mean, that is a radical thing to do. That's a, that's a worthwhile thing to, to have confidence in. And then to you have that as our basis for responding to the world. Who knows where we'll make a difference? Maybe we won't make a difference at Washington, D.C., but we make, might make a world of difference in Redwood City or with our neighborhood or in people that we meet and encounter.
So if some of the dire predictions of where this country, country is going come true, hopefully we will be ready to face them from the depths of our goodness. Not falling back into anxiety. To be anxious is to have a lack of confidence. I'd encourage you to look at what you have confidence in and see if you have a confidence or hints of something you can have confidence in that's a significant alternative to anxiety and to hostility. And if we can find that alternative, then I think there's hope for all of us. And if not for all of us, then at least for you. May you live a confident life. So thank you for that. And um, I wish you well through the next few weeks. Thank you. <laughs>